Good afternoon and welcome to the Oral History Association's second webinar of 2019 entitled Finding Common Ground at the Intersection of Cultural Sustainability and Oral History, led by our capable um, facilitators, to, facilitators today, Amy Skillman and Linda Schultz. My name is Chris McCusker. I'm the co-executive director of the Oral History Association, and we're pleased to welcome both our Oral History Association members today and our friends from the American Folklore Society. Please note that this is the first of two co-sponsored uh, webinar between our two organizations. And without further ado, let me turn you over to our facilitators, Amy and Linda. Hello? I am so sorry. I'm not maybe sure it why it isn't maybe coming up. A minute. What does it say? that. Well, can you all hear me? I'm saying yes. Okay, good. So I apologize. I'm not sure why the video isn't working. It was just working a minute ago. <clears throat> but um, let me just go ahead and start with a, a brief introduction. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Linda and I are really happy to be here and uh, to and it's been really fun for us, I think, to um, to work on this together and, and have these conversations amongst ourselves. Um, so thank you all for joining us for what I hope will be a lively conversation about the intersections of oral history, folklore and cultural sustainability. Linda Shopes and I have known each other for a long time, first working in Pennsylvania where um, significant attention was paid to industrial heritage as a form of tourism and sustainability. And we both approached that topic from our differing perspectives of oral history and folklore, but, um, but we felt we were able to really find common ground in a way that we believe expanded the knowledge, the programming, and the community engagement for those projects. So more recently, we've been able to fine tune our conversations and thinking in the context of our roles as faculty and academic director for the MA in Cultural Sustainability at Goucher College. What we have found, and we hope you'll see today, is that both cultural sustainability and oral history are emergent fields that are intrinsically interdisciplinary with points that touch and intersect each other. They share a commitment to put intellectual effort to work in the world in ways that advance social justice and community well being. And, um, you know, so oral history is a method of inquiry, both useful to and compatible with cultural sustainability work. It encourages students to consider the topics and issues that concern them in an historical context inviting them to situate their work in both time and in space. Um, and it may also bring, I think, a critical, um, the critical sensibility of the historian to bear on their work. Cultural sustainability, on the other hand, contributes to oral history as a method of community engagement by honoring local knowledge, valuing individual perceptions of truth, history and fact, and collaborating with communities to recognize and sustain their treasured ways of life. 
So we'll begin with a brief overview of um, an outline of our time together. And to that, I turn to Linda. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Linda Shobes, and it's a pleasure to be engaging in this conversation with Amy. I echo her welcome to you all. Uh, let me outline how we're going to proceed over the next 90 minutes. Amy's going to uh, begin by giving an overview of the emergent field of cultural sustainability. And then I, in the spirit of mutual inquiry, will pose a few questions to her following up on some of her initial comments. Then we'll reverse the process. I will speak briefly about how I have approached oral history as a historian operating in the field of cultural sustainability ending with the suggestion that my work in that field is stimulating me to rethink certain assumptions about oral history. Amy will then pose some follow-up questions to me. Then Heidi, uh, Heidi Lucero, a graduate of the MA in Cultural Sustainability program at Goucher College, whom both Amy and I have taught, will present her work documenting the revival of the chin tattoo among California Indians, work that draws upon the principles of cultural sustainability and the methods of oral history. This will cover the first hour. During the last half hour or so, we'll open the webinar to your questions and comments, which you can submit via the chat function. So now let me turn things back to my colleague with a few words of formal introduction. Amy Skillman is a folklorist whose work spans nearly 40 years of field research, community engagement, grant making, public programming, and partnership de development, especially among refugee and immigrant women. She joined the MA program in cultural sustainability at Goucher College in uh, 2011, teaching the course on cultural partnerships and then moved to her current role as academic director in 2012. Uh, she also continues to teach in the program. So Amy. So thank you so much, uh, Linda. So first I'd like to start by um, outlining some of the guiding principles of cultural sustainability as an emerging field. Um, so as an emerging field, um, I think we have the luxury of continuing to refine and define what we mean by cultural sustainability. I suppose this is actually the responsibility of all disciplines, but it seems especially relevant when establishing a new uh, field or a new approach to our work. In the past year, two new books have been published, and I have um, images of their covers here for you to see. Um, these books both explore uh, what is meant by cultural sustainability and more scholarship is in the works, but to date there really isn't that much literature um, on cultural sustainability as a field. Um, so in our program, the MA in Cultural Sustainability, we invite our students to develop their own definitions of cultural sustainability and then to edit each other's definitions, both as a strategy for coming up with um, kind of a collective understanding of what they mean by cultural sustainability, but also as a way for them to fine tune uh, a, an understanding of the field uh, from their own perspective in the work that they want to do. So to begin, cultural sustainability is an interdisciplinary approach to the study of culture which honors local knowledge and individual expression, strives to create the conditions for cultures to thrive, and collaborates with communities to advocate for cultural equity. Cultural sustainability offers, therefore, a theoretical framework that brings together the best of folklore, anthropology, oral history, nonprofit leadership, environmental studies, community organizing, and cultural policy in support of cultural equity. So that means that cultural sustainability is an action-oriented practice. In particular, we seek to prepare the next generation of cultural advocates who will work closely with individuals and communities to identify, sustain, and enhance their important artistic traditions, 
their their ways of life and their vital relationships to each other with a goal to ensure cultural equity in the places where they live, work, and play. And by cultural equity, I mean creating a society that values difference and provides equal access to resources that enable all cultures to thrive and to get along with each other, to see our common humanity <clears throat> and to respect the different ways that we enact that humanity. So we ask our students, how do cultures find ways to sustain what is of value and how do we create opportunities for engagement, understanding, and empathy across cultures? Many communities are doing this work, tapping into resources that are already available to them, like heritage tourism, language classes, community events, markets, documentation and archiving, and intergenerational knowledge sharing. So we ask ourselves, where do we step in how do we bring our own resources, skills, and knowledge to this fine work? We have recently forged a partnership with the Smithsonian Institution's Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. They have identified cultural sustainability as a vital component of their work and describe it as a shift away from, quote, reified and ossified discourses of preservation to more dynamic and ecological models of sustainability, end quote. <clears throat> so we frame our work around four foundational questions. Now, I know that there's a lot to read on this slide, but what I wanted was for you to see the larger context for each of the questions, the key questions there printed in red. <clears throat> As you can see, they lead from a very local perspective, working with community to sustain its traditions and practices to a much more global perspective, working to sustain the planet and our relationship to it and to each other. So this breadth is intentional. We understand that culture is a critical part of sustainability. If we cannot create the cultures, I mean, I'm sorry, the conditions for cultures to thrive at the local level, we cannot hope to thrive as a global com community and even as a planet. Um, providing the opportunity for communities to be heard, seen, embraced, and included is what Rory Turner calls radical critical empathy. To sustain, after all, is to be held from underneath. As Turner says, we must be able to have empathy not as a gesture of condescending appreciation, but as a lived experience. If we are to sustain, we must hold this from below. So this is our work um, by paying attention to culture and honoring its critical role in our sense of self and community, we create the conditions for cultures to thrive. Moving on, and um, and I think also to shape the ways that they to shape their own future in their own terms, essentially to thrive in a climate that also fosters well-being. So now I approach cultural sustainability as a folklorist, and in fact, many folklorists were involved in the development of the program. The field of folklore shares concepts with anthropology, literature ethnomusicology, and history. While anthropology tends to focus on larger systems of culture, folklorists are interested in individual forms of expression that, quote, have a lineage, as my colleague Lisa Rachi says, that are held in common by a group of people for whom these forms of expression are important enough to continue to practice them from one generation to the next. Now, this might include narratives, songs, art, ecological knowledge, rituals, customs, and foodways, among others, essentially the ways in which we make sense of our world. These forms of expression reflect our worldview and provide a window into understanding each other. 
in a folklorist methodology, the interview is one element of a larger fieldwork strategy, which includes participant observation, story circles, background research, reciprocal ethnography, or engaging your contributors actually in the process of research and interpretation, and uh, visual and audio documentation. So my particular area of interest has been in public or applied folklore, working with artists and communities to identify their needs and bring the resources of public agencies to support those needs. Collaboration is at the core of this work. There is a network of public folklorists across the country, and I see that some of them are with us today. <clears throat> Many are focused on not in nonprofit community organizations, as well as state arts councils or humanities councils. They are applying the skills, perspectives, and theories of the discipline to address social justice issues, to promote agency among marginalized communities, and to break down the barriers of prejudice, discrimination, and stereotyping, which are rooted in a fear of the unknown. My interest has been to turn that fear into curiosity and perhaps acceptance. Collaboration and public programming provide opportunities for conversations and for engagement. So let me offer you some examples of how a folklorist approaches research. In my work with immigrant and refugee women, I certainly make an effort to understand the historical context for their migration experience, but I'm also interested in how their traditions, art forms, and other cultural practices have supported or hindered their resettlement efforts, how cultural traditions enable or prevent resiliency. I've collaborated with refugee and immigrant women to gather powerful stories and design public programs that might influence people's perceptions of their contributions to our communities to begin to break down that fear of the unknown that seems so prevalent in our society today. To offer another example from a longstanding collaboration between the Oral History Association and the American Folklore, Folklore Society, when a folklorist plans an interview with a Vietnam veteran, she would be interested in the context of that veteran's experience, but she might also explore ways the soldier found to cope with challenges. She might explore activities that helped to create a sense of community for the veteran. Jokes, rituals, artistic expressions, games, personal experience narratives, as well as their sense of what was happening and how it impacted their experience both at the time and in retrospect. One of my favorite examples from the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress is a series of envelopes mailed to a loved one back home that were covered in drawings depicting the soldiers' everyday experiences. Often funny, rarely overtly political, they offered the soldier an outlet for sharing his desires, fears, and dreams, and for coping with his reality. Now you can easily access these images by searching in the digitized uh, database at the Veterans History Project um, on the Library of Congress website. And if you use the search word creative works, um, it will, these kinds of examples will come up. And in just a couple of minutes of searching, <clears throat> several examples came up of but demonstrating, I think, what folklorists look for and hope to uncover in their research um, uh, in their research process. So these are just two examples of the ways a folklorist might work in the context of oral history. And I'm sure there are many more which uh, we may uh, get into uh, later on in our conversation with you all. Uh, Amy, thank you. Um, for that good overview of cultural sustainability, what it focuses on, what its animating principles are, and its vision. Um, now let me follow up with some more specific questions. Um, Amy's trying to get I am so sorry. I'm really a trying visual to... of us up here. Maybe you can just take a minute yeah. to I see am... why this to... isn't happening. Okay. Select camera. 
and I've selected that camera. I am so sorry, I don't know why it's coming up with no, with just black. The camera is not even coming on. Is it plugged in? I just plugged it in. Yeah, it's not blue. Messages, but, um, All right, I'm going to try once more. <clears throat> so I'm going to select the camera. And I'm going to start and start sharing. Okay, so... All right, well, let me go back to um, one of our images so that at least you have something more interesting to look at while uh, while we're chatting here. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, Linda. I, sorry. I apologize to everybody. It was working a couple of minutes ago. and uh, Three trial runs and it all worked, so yeah. who knows. Um, so let me follow up, Amy, with some questions. Okay, great. Um, in the cultural sustainability program at Goucher, students are required to take two courses that emphasize cultural documentation. The oral history course is an elective that some also take. Um, how do you see these courses as different and how do they complement each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think this gets at the heart of, um, of our conversation. The cultural, our students take two cultural documentation courses, which <clears throat> cover the breadth of ethnographic field methods and, um, and focus really on audio and visual documentation in a contemporary context. So documenting uh, what's going on in a community at that time or documenting a, a person's um, experiences or art form. It also focuses on um, the ethics of working with as opposed to in community, and I think that this preposition is really important. How do we work with the community? <clears throat> they also look at questions of intellectual property, and in particular of cultural representation. How are what are the what are the ethical considerations when representing or representing a culture? Um, oral history is one form of an interview that our students might do. <clears throat> um, I believe it gives them the skills of the depth of that interview process, as well as very competent strategies for analysis and interpretation of that interview material. It also fine tunes their interview skills and uh, makes them better listeners, I think, overall, which uh, strengthens and strengthens their critical thinking skills. So now if a student in our program has a particular interest in the historical context for the topic that they're interested in, or in a deeper investigation of that topic, <clears throat> as well as developing interview skills um, grounded in historical research, then we would certainly urge them and advise them to take the oral history course as an elective. And I would be delighted to have <laughs> Yes, um, <laughs> you've worked with several of our students, which has um, been great. Now, you brought up the concept of individual truth, which I will also get into, but um, tell me why you think this is important in a conversation about the intersection of oral history and cultural sustainability from, from your point of view. Yeah, so to this, I've been really fascinated with this idea of truth for a while now, especially <clears throat> when I uh, look at kind of different scholarly approaches to what what they, what they find as or identify as truth. And in fact, I just finished reading a novel by Michael Palin called The Truth, which offers an excellent opportunity to examine how we interpret and understand truth in, from different perspectives. It has an anthropologist, it has an activist, and it has a journalist in that novel. And it's really interesting the way that the notion of truth kind of plays out in that in that book in the story. Um, as a folklorist, um, for me, it's less important 
if someone gets the date right for an event or if they get an, a, a correct accounting of who happened to be there. So I, I'm more interested in um, kind of making right uh, their perceptions. Um, I'm interested in their interpretations of what happened and understanding what that interpretation might mean in a larger context, so how they reacted. And I think one example of this, and, and you know, I think we have a shared example here of the, um, in New York City after the attacks on the World Trade Towers in um, 2002, um, folklore spent uh, quite a bit of time immediately gathering stories um, about people's reactions to that, um, that event. They also spent time documenting the kind of tangible expressions of grief um, as well as the looking at the stories and the way they were sustaining people through that experience. And this collection was less about having, I think, an accurate record of that moment in time than it was about understanding individual responses to that experience. You know, so, so I feel like everybody had their own truth about what was happening and what was going on and their truth um, helped them kind of shape their worldview going forward from that experience. So I'm still exploring this notion of truth um, uh, um, a lot. Obviously, I checked out this book on uh, the truth. Um, but but it feels to me that the oral historian, and we could talk about this, um, would seek to kind of uh, set that experience in a more historical context um, and to create a kind of collective truth um, using multiple voices around that experience, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, you identified public programming and collaboration as key elements of work in cultural sustainability. And again, in your view, how does oral history support these goals? Mm -hmm. uh, because certainly it does. Yeah. So yeah, I think um, collaboration is at the key of work in cultural sustainability and then public programming uh, largely in order to, um, you know, kind of get the get people's perceptions and experiences out there. But to be effective, I think to really influence perceptions of justice and equity, public programming needs to be grounded in a deeper knowledge of the communities that are participating um, so in my work to develop exhibitions and theater productions with refugee and immigrant women, um, their personal stories um, were at the heart of those activities, but many of those personal stories connected to historical events um, in their lives. So it was really important to meld that deeper historical research with, um, with the documentation of their personal stories. Um, and, you know, I think oral historians and folklorists both share this understanding that over time, the narratives that we tell and the stories that we share change and evolve. They expand or they contract or they grow based on different, differing opportunities to share those stories um, or experiences to share them. And I think, you know, but at the activist level, um, you know, like drawing on, uh, drawing attention to the value of these personal narratives for these women had a really powerful impact on them. Um, I think we found that when we really listened, when we pay attention um, to their personal story and to the depth of that story, that we provide a context for these women to understand both their relationship to each other and to the larger forces that are influencing and sometimes disrupting their lives. So the stories, um, their stories then set through public programming, through collaborative public programming in that larger historical context, I think is where the oral history piece really enhances, um, enhances an understanding of those personal stories. So really, Amy, um, you're a um, oral historian masquerading as a folklorist. <laughs> You could say the opposite of me. Right, but, you're um, a folklorist masquerading <laughs> as an oral historian, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, can you, uh, just to uh, wind up here, uh, share some examples of um, cultural sustainability work um, that made good use of, of oral history? Yeah. So we'll hear about one in a minute. We've got um, Heidi Lucero with us today, who is a graduate alum, just a recent alum. 
um, of the uh, of the Max program. Um, and there are several examples that I could share, but I think I'll focus on one that is currently being developed by um, a woman um, who is um, of Afro-Caribbean descent. And she is using oral history to gather um, detailed stories of uh, three generations, but three sisters, and then the three generations below those three sisters, um, to really look at um, how culture and their cultural traditions and their, their rituals and their language and their food and any other forms of um, folklore, folk life for them, may um, impede and or support their resettlement process in the United States. So she's using the methodology of oral history to get some really deep understanding. And her goal ultimately, and I think this is where it connects particularly to cultural sustainability, um, is uh, to create uh, some form, either, either a video or a toolkit um, for her, home, her own family, but then maybe ultimately others to understand how culture and tradition um, enables them to uh, stand in their own shoes um, in kind of largely white spaces when they're constantly interacting in larger white spaces. How do they maintain that sense of strength and cultural identity in those contexts? So she's using oral histories to try to get that, that information and interpret that. So, so yeah, so uh, anyway, thank you for asking me those great questions. Um, now, um, I'd like to um, turn things back over to Linda, who will talk about teaching oral history in the context of cultural sustainability. Linda's been teaching oral history in our graduate program at Goucher since 2012. She brings to her class more than 40 years of experience in all phases of oral history, from project planning to interviewing to publishing, and has written widely um, in the fields of both oral and public history. She also brings a very active interest in Baltimore history to our Baltimore-based campus and to the experiences of our students when they're with us on campus. Great. So, so let me go to thanks, Amy. Your slideshow. Right. Good. Um, I do approach oral history as a historian. What this means in brief is that I seek connections between individual personal experience and broader historical patterns. Of course, I am curious about, often gripped by, the biographical narrative what happened, what a person thinks happened, what they make of what happened, their personal truth, if you will. Um, but I also seek in the questions we ask, and especially in the interpretations we bring to bear upon an interview, connections with something outside the individual, outside or beyond the personal. I seek what we might call intersecting historical contexts that surround the individual. So I ask my students to define the historical circumstance or problem or question, the problematic as I refer to it, that underlies the topic they pursue in an oral history interview or project. Basically, the historian's so what question. So following up on Amy's examples, you're doing an interview with a Vietnam veteran Sure, you ask him about his personal experience of war and its subsequent impact on his life. But you also consider the social circumstances that resulted in his being in Vietnam in the first place. You ask about social relations within his unit and the impact of the anti-war movement and the cultural revolution of the time on him and on his fellow soldiers. You ask his views on the politics of the war itself and on its long-term political impact. Or you're doing an interview with a recent immigrant to the United States. Of course, you ask about their reasons for immigrating, the push-pull factors, their journey to the new country, the challenges of making a new life, including, as Amy suggests, the cultural traditions they carry with them. 
but you do so in a way that is savvy about the politics of their home country, including gender politics, about race and ethnic prejudice in this country, and the legalities and illegalities of residence. You ask about their, you are savvy about their particular economic niche. I tell my students that the hardest part of doing an oral history interview is thinking of questions that get at these contextual issues through the lens of personal experience. You don't ask, ask the vet about the social circumstances that led to his being in Vietnam. Unless he had a PhD in sociology, he might say, what are you talking about? Um, you ask about his family, his education, how he envisioned his future, and then how he came to be enlisted or drafted. You ask the recent immigrant not only why she left her homeland, but also why, in her view, conditions were as they were and what choices she felt she had there. Now, I'm sure this view of oral history reflects my own personal history. I came to oral history more than four decades ago, as Amy said, within the context of the social movements of the late 1960s and 1970s, and also within the ascendancy of social history that both influenced and was influenced by those movements. As a young woman seeking to define myself within a world in flux, I found in history a way to see my own life in context and so feel less alienated in the swirl of personal and social change. And I found in oral history a way to restore to our common knowledge and to confer dignity and respect to the lives of people like my own immigrant grandparents, like my striving working class parents, like my own gendered life, like all those who have been ignored, marginalized, and devalued. As I've said hundreds of times, oral history opens up possibilities for democratizing the content, the process, and the audience for history. And appropriately situated, it can support and open up possibilities for social change. And all of this, I think, for me, was a way to, as I have said, ameliorate alienation. As a historian, I value evidence, argument, and clear writing. I require my students to do background research for their interviews. We talk about the kinds of evidence oral history provides, the difference between history and memory, and oral history as an artifact of memory. We consider the narrative aspects of oral history and differences between oral history and storytelling. I require my students um, to assess and interpret the interviews they do for their final project. As I have sought to distinguish oral history from other kinds of interviews and field practices, I have tended to characterize it as follows. It is, first of all, an interview, an exchange, a dialogue between two people, not simply recorded speech. It's for the record. Oral history is, among other things, an archival practice. Interviews are typically preserved and made available to others. It's historical in intent. It's an inquiry with time depth, with an historical dimension. It's a conversation in the now about the then with all that implies. Oral history is also inherently subjective and intersubjective. An interview is grounded in memory and language and two frames of reference that seek a common, if not necessarily agreed upon, understanding. It is also an inquiry in depth, not a casual or spontaneous conversation, but planned and somewhat structured. And it's oral, or in the case of deaf interviewers and narrators, visual, grounded in voice and gesture. But I'm beginning to think that this characterization, though not wrong, is limited. I think the field of oral history, perhaps like folklore, is in the midst of a paradigm shift. As someone said to me recently, we're doing 21st century oral history now, not 20th century oral history. And my work in 
a cultural sustainability program is supporting and I think even provoking me to shift into a 21st century mode of thinking about oral history, a point I think Amy will follow up on in her questions to me. Great. So thank you. That's a, um, a great overview of oral history. And I feel like the more we talk, the more we're finding commonalities in I know. really <laughs> in, in the ways that we work and in and in our long-term goals. And maybe that's why we're both in cultural sustainability now, right? So let me um, ask first, um, maybe if you could expand a little bit more on where you see oral history fitting into this the broader scope of cultural sustainability. Right. Um, well, I tell the students in the program that oral history is a tool in their cultural sustainability toolkit. They will come out of my class knowing something about the professional practice of oral history, how to plan an oral history project, how to do an oral history interview, how to make sense of material that they've gathered, and how to use oral history to advance both professional and social goals. These are skills that they can include on their resume and put to use in many work situations. But even more, oral history can be a resource for community development and understanding and a resource for social change. It's a way for communities to document their own history, their own practices of sustainability, if you wish, without the intrusion of so-called experts to decolonize their history in current par parlance. It, it affords local communities, however you define that term, to decolonize their own history. It's also a way to bring forward aspects of the past that have gone unrecognized or have been suppressed within the dominant narrative of a community's history, histories of ethnic, racial, and sexual minorities, for example, or of events either shameful or praiseworthy in a community's past. Here, oral history is a way to emphasize both oppression and agency. I think it's also a humane and compelling way to tell multiple stories and to encourage different segments of a community to listen carefully to one another. Um, and if you are willing to take it on, to make evident the inequalities or the relations of power, as I put it, underlying problems that bedevil us in the present, like gentrification or disparities in healthcare. I also see what might be called an ethical congruence between a lot of oral history and cultural sustainability, a common appreciation for the integrity of a person's story, a common understanding um, of the tensions in our own role as cultural workers, mm -hmm. a joint commitment to put academic and professional pursuits to work in the world, as the National Council on Public History puts it, and not just any work, but work that seeks social betterment or social justice, if you will. Um, the notion of a shared authority that is the inherently dialogic nature of the work we do is built into the DNA of both oral history and cultural sustainability. And I, I think it just makes us natural allies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you talked about this a little bit, but um, let's have you uh, talk a little bit more about how the participation, your participation in the MAX program has changed your ideas about oral history and in particular about teaching. Well, it's about oral history. It's pushing me to think, as I've suggested, more critically about certain ideas I've held about oral history. Oral history, as I've said, is in the midst of a paradigm change. The consequence, I think, of the confluence of a number of factors, including the accelerating breakdown of traditional disciplines within the academy, a factor also, I think, influencing the emergence of cultural mm -hmm. sustainability. Mm -hmm. So consider, for example, the six qualities of oral history that I listed earlier. Well, they aren't wrong, but they all focus on the interview. Mm. Of course, we talk about preparation and follow-up, but the interview, the act of interviewing, has lain at the center of our practice. 
partly as a result of my engagement with colleagues and students in cultural sustainability, I've begun to think of oral history more expansively as a series of relationships. There's first of all the relationship with the communities of interest in which interviews are embedded, including our relationship with the advisors and I think more properly collaborators and partners with whom we work through the entire oral history process. Defining why we're doing a project anyway and what the purpose of it is. There's the very particular and often very intimate relationship we share with individual narrators. And there's our relationship with the broader publics with whom we share our work in formats ranging from books to dramatic presentations, websites to walking tours. I'm reminded of something Stephen High, who has directed the massive Montreal Life Stories pro uh, project out of Concordia University in Montreal, who has said oral history doesn't have to begin and end with the recorded interview. Mm -hmm. um, cultural sustainability has also attuned me more to the narrative and aesthetic aspects of an interview. As someone has said, and I suspect it was a folklorist, it's not the tale, it's the telling. Mm -hmm. It's not solely the evidentiary value of oral history that matters. Um, the way people put their story together, the narrative and performative quality of an interview also has value and actually is itself a form of evidence. You know, in terms of teaching, it's made me more aware of teaching also as a relationship. I have certain things to offer students, particular ways of understanding oral history that are more or less relevant to their own interests and ways of thinking. Now, my job is to try and hook what I know and my way of thinking to their concerns and approaches. And their job is to exercise their own creativity in relation to what I have to offer and make it their own, to take what's useful, amend it, adjust it, or discard if it's not useful. Mm -hmm. I tell them straight up, feel free to disagree with me. I have no problem with that. I welcome it. Mm -hmm. I think it takes a certain, um, you know, the privilege of age to, mm -hmm. you know, fine, yeah. disagree with me. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Um, teaching in the MAX program has also made me less concerned with coverage and more attuned to integration. The good work that some of our students do has made me understand more fully that they aren't simply vessels to be filled with information, but conscientious and creative individuals who can use oral history to advance their own agenda. It's made me more aware of the consequences of our work, too. I tend sometimes, given my critical bent, to think of history as a blunt instrument. Put the truth of the past out there with all its bloody injustice, its terrible inequalities, so that people finally get it. Yeah, well, discussing this, one student said to me, we have to be careful not to do more harm than good. Well, that struck me. Work in the world requires both moral courage and a sensitivity to audience in ways that researching and writing for one's peers do not. Mm. That insight, perhaps coming late in my career, has been quite humbling. Yeah, that's great. I, um, yeah, powerful stuff there. Um, so, you know, so you talked about some of the benefits or the values that you're seeing the connections with, with cultural sustainability, yeah. but do you also see some tension or friction? Yeah. Um, I'm a historian for a reason. Temperamentally, I'm attracted to the critical sensibility that historians bring to our work and to the world. So I'm the one who asks, why is this culture or this aspect of a culture worth sustaining? What about those elements of a culture that do not contribute to the well-being of our communities or our planet? I'm the one who punctures a hole in the everyone has their truth rhetoric. Well, sure, everyone does, and that's important to understand. Amy's example of 9-11 interviews is a case in point. But I'm the one who asks, what if that truth is simply false? I'm not mm -hmm. talking about a wrong date or a name, 
people often get that wrong, and I don't think we should be in the business of communicating inaccurate information, but that's not my point here. I'm really talking about historical misrepresentation. Like I has, as I have heard, denial of the fact that lynchings occurred in Maryland in the 20th century. That's not just wrong, that's dangerous. So how do we make sense of that? And what do we do about it in our work? Mm -hmm. I'm also the one who says, community is an imaginative construct that all too often implies a commonality and a comity or an agreement that are simply fictive. And that diversity is often accompanied by inequality. So is there a tension or a friction between oral history and cultural sustainability in the end? I don't think so. I think it's more a matter of emphasis. Folklore focuses on cultural expression and cultural equity. Oral history on social relationships, power, and the relationship between past and present. I suspect some of my oral history colleagues are not entirely comfortable with the practice that doesn't focus more explicitly on the research and archival aspects of oral history and also the technology of interviewing, just as I suppose some folklorists are uncomfortable with public folk folklore. I myself am not entirely comfortable with the celebratory quality of some work in folklore and an optimism about the positive possibilities of cultural work. While I'm equally sure some of my folklore colleagues get annoyed with what has sometimes been termed my relentless criticality, not by people in the cultural sustainability program that I teach in, but other colleagues, mm -hmm. <laughs> people in the world. Um, but when I, when I think of the work our students do, the principles and the intentionality that they bring to it those concerns are pretty well obviated. Um, you know, honestly, it's really a privilege to work with them. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So, you know, that <laughs> there are several points you made. I mean, just this these notions of um, what is community and um, some of the other points that you made are, are actually as well questions that folklorists raise, as you say, you know, that it's, um, I think we're, we are, we're asking these questions sort of more broadly across the humanities, you know, and it's sure. and maybe it's a it's a matter of methodology and process that is really where there are some differences. But um, but anyway, thank you uh, for that. This has been really fun, and I'm sure that we could continue to talk for several hours. But we want to turn over to Heidi Lucero to give you all um, a glimpse into a project that has just been completed. In the, in the cultural sustainability program. So Heidi is a, um, as I said, she just finished her, her master's thesis and uh, she is a um, cultural leader in her tribal community in uh, Southern California and, um, and uh, is actually a force to be reckoned with from all I can see. I don't know when this woman sleeps, but she's been involved in all kinds of projects um, in her own uh, community and came into the program uh, seeking ways to to uh, strengthen that work. So Heidi, let me turn it over to you. Um, I believe here comes your slideshow. Yes. I, Heidi, can, I'm I'm not hearing you. Do you have your microphone on? Am I on now? I on? There you are. Now you're on. Okay. Miu Yam, Notung Heidi Lucero Yaka, Ahasha my English, Kimutsun Aloni. Hello, everyone. My name is Heidi Lucero, and I am here to present 
um, a little bit about my project um, on um, for my master's on cultural sustainability at Goucher College. And it's called As Seen Through Indigenous Eyes and Heard Through Indigenous Voices, a Storytelling Project. This project is about documenting the revival of chin tattooing among California Indians. And it's an intersection of storytelling and tattooed forms of identity. Um, the underlying reasons for the project were after receiving my own tattoo, I had a very negative reaction from my immediate family, specifically my mother. After receiving my tattoo, she um, didn't talk to me for four years. So that was one of the main underlying reasons. Um, but also after receiving my tattoo, I realized that there was a huge gap in knowledge among both the native community and the community at large about the range of the tattooing practice in California. Um, there were also, um, when I was researching for my own tattoo, um, with issues with accessing the historic information. Um, there were also issues locating an indigenous uh, practitioner or artist. And I also realized that there was a need to build a California Indian tattoo artist or practitioner collective. Um, when I was doing the historic research for this project, I um, realized that the information was very limited. It was very incomplete. It was hard to access. A lot of the information is not published. It's um, in the form of field notes that are in archives that um, as um, an indigenous person, I was having trouble even accessing them in those archives. The information was not very detailed. Some of the information was simply a sentence or two. It didn't give any information about um, the ceremonial practices or the songs that went with it. It basically said that there was chin tattooing and that was it. Um, some of the more detailed information um, comes from a colonizer's worldview, and I was looking for more of a indigenous point of view. And a lot of the information when it was being collected wasn't seen as important because it was traditionally in most tribes, a woman's ceremony and women's ceremonies weren't documented because the ethnographers were men. So when doing my own academic research, I found that there was nothing academically written by California Indians about the practice of tattooing. A recent book that came out uh, in 2018 was um, We Are Dancing For You, Native Feminism and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age Ceremonies by Dr. Uh, Kutcha Balding Reesley, who is uh, California Indian from Hoopa up in Northern California. She talks about the revitalization of the ceremony that is involved with the tattooing, but she doesn't talk much about the actual practice of tattooing, um, just a sentence or two as well. So there really was nothing academically written by California Indians. Um, but during this project, as I interviewed these women and the one man I interviewed, I realized that I had been doing research on traditional tattooing for a long time, but I didn't really realize it. Being involved in community and ceremony, language, basketry, native foods, and medicine. These aspects of culture are uh, intertwined and encompass the people we are and how we are reviving culture in our California Indian communities. And by doing digital storytelling and oral history interviews, I was giving agency back to um, the communities to interpret their own stories instead of having them interpreted by somebody else. So,
Okay, His, um, the indelible marker of tribal identity is how we see this tattoo. So historically it was done uh, during or around a coming of age ceremony. And this ceremonial aspect of getting your tattoo is something that continues today. Uh, contemporarily, this um, has changed because culture is dynamic and has to evolve with a changing society and a changing world. But we realized as Indigenous people that we need to determine what the future of this practice is going to be for it to be sustainable. So the methodologies that I used were um, decolonizing methodologies, Indigenous methodologies, um, oral history or return to oral methods of passing knowledge. Um, I also use digital storytelling along with the um, oral history interviewing because the tattoo was such an outward facing marker of um, identity. I felt that it was very important that people see that as well. Um, as a researcher and interviewer, um, I return control of all the research, the stories um, back to my community. I was only asking my community members to allow me to share their story um, because historically our information has been taken from us as indigenous people and never returned back. And I also uh, chose not to interpret the information as this also has been um, an issue historically that our stories have been interpreted and, and been interpreted incorrectly or from a differing worldview. So during my research, there were some particular themes that came out of the interviewing process. Um, Many of the interviewers, um, interviewees stated that the marks are for identification purposes um, in this life as well as when we cross over into the spirit world. Everyone who I interviewed was immersed in culture and community prior to receiving their tattoos. Um, that the tattoo actually solidified their, commi their commitment to their community. Ceremony was involved in everyone's um, tattooing process. Um, that the tattoo was being normalized with our children and that they were um, concerned about uh, making sure that they had an indigenous artist um, to apply their tattoo. So, um, I don't know what happened to the photo here. Um, Jack Potter, in an interview with Jack Potter, um, with his dad, he said, I'm actually going to bring over a clip. If you turn up your volume a little bit, you can probably hear it. It's kind of low, but I'm going to read what he said. When um, I had it, that's like, oh, that's so good. He said, you know, he said when we go to cross over, he said they'll really recognize you. He said the old people, especially, he said they'll know you based on your mark. So he said when he in the conversation with his father, he said when you go to cross over, he said they will really, really recognize you. And he said the old people, especially, he said they'll know you based on your markings. So he was referring to the tattoos on his chin. Everyone was immersed in culture and community prior to receiving their tattoos. A lot of them are traditional dancers, they're in uh, language revival, they're medicine people, they're artists. So, and a lot of them are all five of those, or five or six, they're all doing all kinds of things within the community, including politics and um, helping children grow up. Um, knowing their culture and their community. Um, and here's a clip from Lynn Riesling. She, um, if you turn up your volume again, you'll be able, you should be able to hear a little bit of it. Reinforced, reinforced you know, my uh, commitment to my culture, my whole identity, you know, it's, it's given me confidence actually in who I am, you know, as a Native. In case you didn't hear it, it says, 
it has reinforced, you know, my commitment to my culture and my whole identity, you know, it's given me confidence actually in who I am, you know, as a native person. And everybody um, was involved in ceremony, whether it was um, having songs sung from community members while they were um, receiving their tattoo or the burning of sage or other medicines during their um, tattooing process or just the tattooing process alone uh, they considered as a ceremony. <clears throat> this is uh, Pim Tripp Allen, one of the women that I interviewed. Um, her statement shows the sustainability of the practice into the future. Um, she says, the children are being raised where the tattoo is normalized. It's an exciting time when our daughters are telling us that they are going to get their tattoos after their flower ceremony. So for her tribe, the flower ceremony is their um, young girls coming of age ceremony, which is when the tattooing practice would be done. And as young girls, these um, young girls go to ceremonies for older um, young women, and they are all painting on their tattoos um, at these ceremonies. So it's something that's being very normalized within um, the community. Um, the other um, important aspect was the artist or the practitioner who was applying tattoos. Uh, when I interviewed most of the people, one of the issues was finding an artist who would actually apply a face tattoo. Um, when the revitalization first started 25 years ago, people, um, tattoo artists, were very hesitant to tattoo people's faces. So a lot of people had trouble finding someone to tattoo them. And the, um, it was really important that they have an indigenous artist. That's one of the newer things that are coming up. Um, and someone that allowed ceremony, someone that allowed the burning of sage, the singing of songs, someone that understood that our ancestors who had come before us were present in that room, and someone that came from a similar worldview. Um, we have some indigenous artists now that are um, coming up and they're helping our communities revive these traditions. And when you had a an uh, indigenous artist, um, there became a deep spiritual connection to your artist. And even doing these interviews and talking to these men and women about um, their process and about their story, um, I've developed a, ve a very deep spiritual connection with these people. And now I am part of their spiritual community as well. So, um, there were so many outcomes and directions that this project um, had developed um, that I really realistically could have used this as a dissertation process or, or project as well. And um, maybe someday I will expand on those topics for a dissertation. Um, but for now, I'm just thankful to have been asked to share this project with you all and continue to educate about the importance of indigenous tattooing in California. I think that's it for me.
Yes. Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, there you are. Can you hear us now? I can. Okay, great. I apologize. Um, so Heidi, I was just saying that um, I, I um, feel like you've given us a nice example of kind of the melding of using oral histories, not only to understand the depth of commitment to chin tattooing and sort of documenting this moment in time, but also um, I think uh, creating a sense of community. So um, we wanna open it up now for questions. Um, I think Heidi has put her contact information in the chat box. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them in to the chat box. Yeah, well, don't just tell us thank you and it was great. <laughs> what got provoked in your thinking? Right. Um, what uh, would you like to push us on or yeah. disagree with us about? Or challenge us. Yeah. yeah. It's really too bad you can't see us because uh, we worked Cause hard. Funny. We, we worked hard to present well. <laughs> I know. I know. It's so disappointing. I, I really. It well. seems like our camera just died. Yeah. I can't get it to work at in all. In the wrong, at the wrong time. <laughs> what I could do, and I even tried, you know, I even tried to switch over. Anyway, any questions? Thank you for your lovely thank yous and comments. Project. Somebody to culture, me. Heather. Linda. Could you expand a bit on what you mean by performative quality of narrative as evidence? Oh, good question. Well, I would I would uh, uh, separate performative and narrative. Um, the way a person tells a story or recounts their personal history. Uh, reflects a culture, the simplest and, and reflects their own worldview. Uh, the simplest way I think I can, or the most obvious example I can give, is that most people in a oral history, life history narrative present themselves as the hero or sometimes the anti-hero of their own story. Mm overcoming odds or being crushed by circumstances. That's less, um, that's less uh, often the, the case. And um, often the people we interview have indeed overcome odds. Mm -hmm. They have. Um, but that is also a deeply embedded trope in our culture that we don't acknowledge the challenges and difficulties. Uh, we emphasize our triumph. And I think that's sometimes uh, to our, our, our detriment because there are terrible failures in our world that are partly personal, but also largely social. And when you um, think of yourself solely as um, the hero of your own story, you don't necessarily see the circumstances that have actually inhibited you and sort of called out heroism, mm -hmm. or um, you fail to acknowledge the, the difficulties and challenges that, that you have faced. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a, that's a, that's a, um, not entirely sanguine cultural cultural trope. Uh, performative, um, I'm on a little shakier ground, but I do know that people present a self in an interview. They perform. Mm -hmm. They perform for an audience. They will perform for the audience of the interviewer and sometimes say what they think the interviewer wants to hear. Mm -hmm. um, they, particularly when you're speaking across class or cultural differences, um, 
they will, um, we're speaking in the now about the then, and people will often present a interpretation of events um, that support a certain performance of self, if you will, in the present um, that's not entirely accurate. Uh, Cliff Kuhn has written about, um, let's see if I can get this right, it's a really good example. Um, there have been several interviews with various parties, Southern politicians, who were involved in the um, election of John F. Kennedy as president. And that was a uh, close election, and the Southern vote was essential. Um, shortly before the, uh, now I can't remember if it was the primary or the final election, King, and maybe somebody who's listening can clarify, King was jailed in Georgia and um, was released shortly before the election. Several uh, politicians have retrospectively claimed um, that they were the man who got Kennedy elected because they were the person who intervened with the court system and got him released from jail right before the election. Mm -hmm. Well, in point of fact, there were several negotiations that included um, some of these individuals, as well as Robert Kennedy, Kennedy's brother, um, and uh, as and some lawyers, as Thurgood Marshall said, it seems like everybody was involved in getting King out of jail, except the attorneys who actually did it. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a performance of a certain sense of self that you want the present to believe uh, uh, to believe well of you. Mm -hmm. So that's my best um, and my best answer, Heather. If you want to push it further, or if you want to. Um, uh, ask further questions on that, that would be good. So now she's, there's another question. How do you see autoethnography in oral history interviewing? <clears throat> well, if you tell me what you mean by autoethnography, I'll try to, <laughs> I'll try to answer it. Because I interviewed myself oh, wow. during the inter uh, interview process and told my story. So you added your story as one of many in the context of research. Does that happen no. in oral history? Yeah, I was wondering if no. that happened in oral um, history. I'll, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, it seems to me perfectly fine to draw upon your own experience. I mean, mm -hmm. that has absolute relevance and bearing. Um, I think if we want to have boxes, I would put that in the box of autoethnography rather than oral history. Um, because our oral history really is a dialogic practice. It's not a memoir. It's a dialogue. And an essential part of that dialogue is perhaps pushing you to ask questions that you wouldn't ask of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would also say that every single one of us, I think, interviews in a way out of ourself. Our questions come out of our disciplinary training and our interests, but also our deep personal interest. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I could make a, a point that kind of epistemologically the line is pretty blurred, but I would reckon that as a different, as a different discipline, not oral history. Personally, I mean, I, on the one hand, I can talk about myself forever, but I'm partly attracted to oral history because I want to hear others. I'm sick of my life <laughs> story, you know, I know my life story. I, I want to broaden my understanding by hearing other people's stories too, but that, you know that's a very personal that's a very personal response. Um, it seems to me it would be perfectly legitimate that you do what you do. Well, it's interesting because I think um, I I don't know if it implies one of the distinctions um, in that an oral historian perhaps focuses on. Um, I mean, you may, you know you've done an awful lot of research that is about that is very much in your line of interest, mm -hmm. but not necessarily about you, right. and not necessarily about your experience. Um, and that in fact, as the interviewer, there's this um, intentional kind of separation. 
from between interviewer and contributor or interviewee. I think in in cultural sustainability, there is a, a very strong um, emphasis on, uh, or at least a, a recognition of um, reflexivity, even to the point of autoethnography, mm -hmm. where for someone like Heidi, who is doing research in an experience that she has personally had, mm -hmm. you know, to have somebody interview her, I totally take your point about, you know, is that person going to be in Heidi's head enough to know the other kinds of questions, or would that person be willing to ask other kinds of questions that aren't on the list that Heidi gave her to ask because Heidi is using this list with all of her other interviews, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's an interesting point. I mean, I think it's an interesting um, dilemma when uh, to to incorporate uh, to actually do autoethnography in your own larger research project. How do you actually pull that off? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you do need to know know yourself, right? I think um, you know I. Um, emphasize perhaps not very much but I, I do and there's a there's a good article in oral history do I like them too much mm. and we tend to interview people we like or want to mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. whose life stories we want to advance people who have been marginalized people who have been ignored mm -hmm. um, or despised even although people certainly interview others but that that's that's um, a tendency and you know the whole perspective of a historian is to you know to ask questions to be critical and we have to watch I think liking our narrators the people we interview too much in a way that we fail to ask the critical questions. And the harder questions and the tougher yeah. questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. what are, you know, like in many, you know, I, I'm thinking of uh, Alessandro Portelli's magnificent study of um, uh, Harlan County. Mm -hmm. I think the book is just called Harlan. He does not ignore the fact that there is within this Appalachian coal mining community, which he has deep respect for, um, there are examples of domestic violence, mm -hmm. primarily men assaulting women. Mm -hmm. Well, do you ignore that because you want to um, show regard and respect for a culture that is often disregarded and disrespected? Well, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. That, well, here is the question of That's the truth. That's the right? truth. Right. Um, or his choice is not to, yeah. but he presents it in what I think is a quite um, thoughtful way that it is in part the result of the stresses on that community. And he also presents the evidence of the community making efforts to address this uh, problem in the community, mm -hmm. local efforts to address mm -hmm. domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, many of the people we interview are full human beings like all of us. You know, I mean, I can think of a book I edited, and, and I'll stop with this example, um, of women who were unhoused. Mm -hmm. And the author of the book, the person who gathered the interviews, chose not to emphasize, and I think correctly, I had no problem with her doing this, she chose not to emphasize the unfortunate choices that some of the women made, generally with a, a romantic partner, a, a poor choice of a partner, that led them on a kind of downward spiral that led to their being unhoused. Mm -hmm. she, chose, she chose to de-emphasize that because all of us, whatever our situation in life, make some unfortunate choices. Her, she much more emphasized the structural conditions that did not provide a safety net, perhaps, mm -hmm. that a more privileged person would have mm -hmm. um, in terms of family support or social support, that these women, with the unfortunate choices that some of them made, 
or disabilities that they had did not have that social safety net. So, you know, it emphasized more the structural conditions of homelessness and the consequences of that rather than the kind of victim story. Right, right. Well, and I think in all the research that we do and the ways that we interpret or write about it, um, you know, we are like, you You do have to make choices. You have to make choices about what you're emphasizing and what your overall larger goal. I mean, in all the work that I did with refugee and immigrant women, many of them, um, you know, there were lots of other stories about right. their experiences, right? right? That, um, but we chose in a very collaborative way to focus on specific specific kinds of stories, you know, and that was partly what they wanted, you know, partly because of the medium we were using to present those stories and and what it was that we collectively wanted to say. So yeah, I mean, do you are you looking, are you create are you doing I have another example of a documentation that was done many years ago where alcoholism was a big part of that community. Mm -hmm. And um, the researcher included that in the person that hired the researcher to do the work was very upset and wanted it taken out. Mm -hmm. And you know, a whole very interesting conversation ensued about how do you how do you present that? But that we've gotten off the we've gotten away from autoethnography and back to truth, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as you know, once somebody said to me who was doing an oral history project in her own um, community, which was a community of immigrants in the Washington DC area whose voices were frequently um, disparaged. Um, why should we air our dirty linen in public? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, why indeed? Yeah, that's, that's a, a legitimate question. It it's a legitimate question. question. Yeah. And yet truth is truth. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are, many are there any other questions? It does not look like there are other questions. So, and we're coming very close to the end of our time. I don't know, Chris or Faith, if you have any last minute comments you would like to add or make. Faith is saying thank you all for coming. Yes, I really appreciate you all being here and would love, um, you have our contact information on the screen in front of you now, I believe. So. If you have other questions or comments or thoughts or want to follow up with any of us, please, please do. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you also to the um, Oral History Association and the American Folklore Society for hosting this. It's a great collaborative effort. Oh, will we be sharing our slides? Ellen McHale is asking if we'll be sharing our slides. Um, you know, that is a, well, this, um, this particular webinar will be available on the OHA website um, AFS that, too, right? and the AFS website. So you can always revisit the, um, <laughs> re revisit the technical, technologically challenged webinar, but at least you get the slides. And if any of you would like to see our slides, um, please just go ahead and uh, send us an email and we're happy to send them to you separately. Well, who owns them? Well, I think we do. I don't know. That's a good question. Who owns this? <laughs> that is a good question. We'll have to work that out with Faith, but I'm sure we own our PowerPoints. We don't own the ones we create for Gantry. It looks like Faith is typing. I don't know if she's got a response or a comment. Well, if we have been um, erroneous in our comments about access to the webinar, um, I'm sure that you can reach out to the Oral History Association and uh, get clarity. There will be a post webinar survey sent out to everyone later today. So. They can still hear us. <sighs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much again, everybody. See you. See you around.